This is Hashtag Finance, presented to you by the Canadian Securities Exchange, the exchange for entrepreneurs, with your host, Barrington Miller. Welcome to a fine edition of Hashtag Finance. This is one of the sub sectors of Hashtag Finance called Mining Mondays. And today I'm here with Mistango and Stephen Stewart, the chairman of this up and coming company. Welcome to the show. Hey, Barrington. Thank you very much for having me. I'm a pleasure, pleasure to join you. Where, where are you right now? I'm in my office. I'm in downtown Toronto, 55 University Avenue, uh, right in the core. I think I'm the only one here, though. Uh, I, here I have. Floor. It's a ghost town down here. I have no doubt. Um, I think I've been, since this whole thing, pre-St. Patty's Day, I've gone downtown once to pick up a monitor and a laptop stand and a lip balm, and <laughs> that was it. So I'm, I'm a little bit west, uh, west of, of the city. Uh, how's, how's the family doing? How are you doing during this... Uh, this COVID. We're doing, you know, we've, we've had to adapt like everybody, but uh, I think we've all um, adjusted. And, you know, me speaking for me personally, I, I have a routine. I live across the street, so I don't take transit. And I just, I get out of the house. I, uh, I give my wife some space and I come here. I've settled into my routine at the office where, again, nobody's here. And I just, I find that me personally, I'm getting a lot more work done. I think our team probably is less efficient because you can't communicate as effectively as you could when they're down the hall, but we're getting it done and we're moving things forward. That said, you know, the external world is, is has additional challenges, whether that's manpower on site. So there's all sorts of challenges, but by and large, we've adapted. I think the same holds true for everybody else and it's going to impact how we do business. And, the, and when I say we, I mean, the broader world does business going forward. Do we need all this office space? Uh, do we need this um, urbanization? So there's, there's a lot of things that are going to come out of this. So it's, it's interesting to think about. Well, you're, you're talking about um, evolving and changing and uh, Mistango as a company has done that. Uh, if you look at the last 12 months versus 24 months or, or even longer than that, uh, this is a new company. This is a new, um, you know, same name, <laughs> different taste. And uh, a lot of it, I'm sure, has credit to the new management that's, that's in, as, as well as a red-hot gold market. Um, just for our audience and for our listeners, let's, uh, let's take us back. What, what does Mistango do? Mistango looks for ore bodies. Very simple. That's our objective. We're looking to make... Um, a world-class discovery in a world-class district. We're focused in the Kirkland Lake district. We've got two flagship assets. One is called the Omega, which has about 585,000 ounces of uh, indicated inferred ounces on the Cadillac, which is about 20 kilometers east of Macassa and right beside the Curradison. And then what has evolved into our flagship is what's called our Ebby Baldwin project. It borders, it's contiguous with the Kirkland Lake Gold's Macassa mine. We have the entire western border and we have the entire western extension uh, along the main, the 04, the, the, the amalgamated, you know, it's where all the major breaks in the area, you know, come together on our little property, not that little, we're about 4,300 hectares, but that's got, gotten us an awful lot of attention as of late. And uh, you're right, Mustango is a new company. It's got, it's, we've kept its name, but it's, it's grown its asset base. We've changed the management. I certainly think that was the major catalyst. When we got involved with Mistango, it's just a little over a year ago, we made the announcement that we, in, we, we acquired 31% of the sh issues and outstanding shares on May 2nd of 2019. It was a penny stock, not, not just a proverbial penny stock. It was literally a penny there was no bid, no ask. There was nothing, nothing going on, and and it was 12 months to turn it around. Uh, but when you know a couple of weeks ago we hit 35 cents, so that's a, a 35 bagger, uh, which is exactly why people get uh, into the juniors. You know, once you get a 10 bagger, they say it's like crack cocaine. But a 35 bagger, it's been a fun <laughs> run. So, uh, when you say we, uh, are you referring to ore finders? I mean our team, and yeah, so we've got a broader team here. We're, we're an entrepreneurial group here, uh, and that encompasses Ore Finders, Power Ore, Mustango, uh, a couple other companies here. We're, we're all affiliated. We're all on the hunt for ore bodies, and we do it in different ways. Um, we've got a technical team. We've got the legal aspects, the compliance aspects. Um, you know, me, you know, I'm sort of the... Um, 
the conductor, if you will, for lack of a better term. I'm, right. I, I utilize my relationships, my knowledge of assets, and I, I put everything together and I push it forward. So just, just for clarity, Ore Finders and Mustango are separate but intertwined. Totally distinct corporations, different shareholder registries. Obviously, there's some overlap. I I'm, I'm would be a prime example of that. Our group is the de facto, well, not de facto, our group that I described before. We encompass the board. We are the management. Uh, Ore Finders owns a little over 20% of the issued and outstanding uh, shares of Mustango. But other than that, they are distinct corporations. They're also very much related geographically. Uh, we, we are both focused in the Crookland Lake camp, which is ultimately why we, you know, got ourselves involved with Mustango because we wanted exposure to its assets. Now, Kirkland Lake, that is, uh, you don't have to be in mining to, to know the name. Um, people often get it confused with Kirkland Lake Gold and the company, uh, but it's its own property, it's its own town, it's its own, its own history. And uh, I watched a, an excellent webinar, which... At the end of this, we're going to make sure it's available to our audience uh, that you did uh, last month. Uh, and you went through the history of Kirkland Lake and I think it's the third largest known or discovery uh, to date. Um, and it's got a really, really good history. And speaking of history, you recommended an excellent Canadiana book. Because <laughs> we did. love reading. I did. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, that's, uh, what's it called? Murdered Midas. And Murdered that's about, Midas, yeah. That's about, uh, I forgot the name of the uh, the author. Uh, she's a Canadian uh, female reporter. And it's about uh, Sir Harry Oakes, who was the richest man in the Canadian empire, maybe the richest man at the world uh, in his era. He started off as a, as a prospector in the bush in Timmins camp, and then he ventured out to KL before anybody knew what Kirkland Lake was. It was literally nothing there. And he spent, you know, I think the book says he spent, you know, almost 10 years toiling away, you know, just trying to find it. And then all of a sudden he found it. And boy, did he found it, find it. And it, what he found, ultimately, he developed what's called the Lakeshore Mine, which was just absolutely phenomenal. I think that had 8 million ounces of super high grade gold. And he, I think he pretty much owned it himself, uh, or at least the vast majority of it. And uh, he, uh, he was fabulously wealthy, dis developed other mines, and then ultimately what this book was about is, is his unsolved mur uh, murder. Um, he, he ended up developing big real estate land in the Bahamas and was murdered, and nobody knows who did it, though they have some theories. But, uh, wow. so, he is, but so he is, so, you know, the history of Harry Oaks is, is intertwined with Kirkland Lake, and it's got a great, you know, allure to it. And, uh, you know, uh, all of us mining entrepreneurs are looking to be the next Harry Oaks minus the, the murder, of course. When, you're, when your group goes and looks for projects and or projects come to you, what are some of the check marks? What are th some of the things that, that tick your boxes? Sure. Well, as I said, first and foremost, we're, all, we're asking ourselves, do we have a good chance at finding an ore body? That's, that's ultimately what we're doing is can we find uh, a geologic uh, event that we can mine or someone can mine at a future time at an economic profit. If we don't see that potential, there's no point in investing. Uh, more specifically, we're asking ourselves, can we make 10 times our money? Okay, because nobody invests, including us in the juniors for a 10% return. We're looking for starting points, 10 times your money. Sometimes you can make 100 times your money, certainly if you're putting these things together. Um, so does the risk justify the reward? That's the second. And then more, uh, more specifically, we do as much as we can to mitigate the risk because finding Hemlo or Voises Bay uh, is once in a lifetime opportunity if you're good and if you're lucky. So we, we mitigate those risks. They always say one in 10,000 anomalies is a, is a mine. Well, you know, that's true if you want to, you know, be very, um, careless in your selection. But if you can uh, look for ore bodies in areas such as Kirkland Lake or in the Abitibi, that mitigates your risk. Okay, we're not looking for necessarily for a green, uh, green fields discovery. If now, how can you lower your costs? You know, are you using helicopters? You know, so I won't get into why, but you know, we look for good infrastructure, uh, access, drilling costs, everything to lower the capital costs or the exploration costs associated with finding these deposits, because that gives you more opportunity to drill more meters ultimately. So, so that's an important aspect. And the second, uh, you know, more specific 
uh, point I'll make is that we look to play the cycles. And what's happened in the last five, six years is the perfect example of that. So you got to, again, finding that once in a lifetime is, is tough, but you can buy things very, very cheap if you buy when nobody else is paying attention. And from, call it 2014 to 20, and, until up six, six months ago, nobody was paying attention. Right. You can buy projects that have had tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars of exploration spent on them for pennies on the dollar. And that's what ore finders did and that's you know and that's how we got involved with mistango i think in a hot gold market uh, maybe we would have been successful in taking out previous management but it, our cost base would have been significantly higher and our cost base relates directly to our level of risk so we try you know and you know to sum it all up we try to mitigate the risk as much as we possibly can because it's a risky business inherently now there's a big name in mining that took an interest uh, not only in um, ore finders, but I think in Mustango. Or I think, yes, yeah, I right. think that was. Uh, tell us a little bit about the relationship with Mr. Sprott. Well, Mr. Sprott, I mean, everybody knows Eric Sprott if you follow the gold space. Uh, he's been around for a long time and he's seen a lot of cycles. He, uh, he's very sharp. Um, he's invested in a lot of juniors as of late. Um, you know, the relationship is such that he we were brought to his attention by me uh because he's got he's had great success in the crookton lake camp and so when mm -hmm. i showed him what we have i got his attention and then it was a a series of um you know correspondence getting him more familiar with what our plans were, are who we are you know answering questions about the project what we're going to do and ultimately he agreed to make an investment in both ore finders and mustango and uh, actually i'll note i think he came in on four separate occasions uh, oh, wow. in the last 90 days to, to, to those companies. So two investments in each of those companies uh, in the last 90 days. So he's, uh, as Mr. Sprott will say, he's pressing his bets. And, uh, you know, he does that with the companies that he believes are doing a good job. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if he thinks we're doing a good job, but our share price, you know, would indicate that so far so good, but we still have work to do. You, uh, you and, uh, and this latest uh, iteration of the company seem very, very aggressive aggressive in your approach, wanting to, uh, wanting this to succeed and wanting to, um, you know, overall like make profit, uh, your shareholders, uh, you, you and the rest of your group seem very, very loyal to your shareholders and your investors. How has it been communicating with them at this time? And how have they responded to you in turn? Well, I think, you know, um, I think we are, I don't know if we're aggressive, but, uh, we're certainly proactive and we're not, we don't sit back, we see opportunity and we go for it. We just sort of take a shot and uh, sometimes we miss and that's fine. We try and learn from our mistakes and not, not repeat them. That's, that's all you can hope for. But certainly you know, fortune favors the bold in a sense, um, while at the same time mitigating our risks. Uh, with respect to our shareholders, we've had very, very loyal shareholders. You know, mm -hmm. this is really speaking on behalf of ore finders more than Mistango because we're, we're newer to that story. But we've had people uh, with us for a long time. There's a core group of people who follow us uh, who are Toronto based and, and have been sitting there patiently in, in a flat, flat, flat market. And they've, they've sat there because they believed in our narrative, which we've done a good job of communicating. So we spend a lot of effort. Uh, communicating exactly what we're going to do, and then we do our best to execute on that. And I think that that matters because I, I can show you dozens, if not you know, more examples of companies that don't communicate with their shareholders. Not just simple back and forth, but really, what are they trying to do, and how do we see the macro, and how are we going to play our own micro into making money for our shareholders because that's what shareholders want to see. So I think most sophisticated investors, long-term investors, not traders, uh, understand the cyclicality of the commodity space and the gold space. They also understand, call it the gold bug narrative, not in a negative sort of sense, but mm -hmm. with all the printing that's been going on circa 2008, now again, this new QE infinity that's occurring in 2020 and beyond. I think we're just at the beginning of a new aggressive uh, quantitative easing program, which is going to grow and grow and grow. That plays right into the gold narrative because you talked about, you, you mentioned you were a gold trader. Well, is it a currency? We think it's the only currency, um, you know, not to get into that argument, but it's the gold narrative is gaining traction in the broader markets. We see guys like Ray Dalio, 
um, you know, as the tip of the spear sort of saying it on CNBC, cash is trash. And what's the alternative? Well, it's gold. What's, uh, what's on the horizon? What's on the horizon for, for Ms. Tango? Ms. Tango, well, it's exciting times. Um, you know, we've, we've had a tremendous run in the stock price and we've been popular and that's great. And, and we'll, we'll enjoy that 15 minutes, but you know what, that's only going to get us so far. So we got to go out and execute. We've, we've raised four and a half million dollars. That's in our treasury. Um, that, is, that is ample money for us to go out there and test our theories in the coming uh, days or week we'll come out with what we, we, we define as our model for the Crooklyn Lake camp and we'll drill down specifically how does that impact the Evie Baldwin so our investors can uh, expect to see a technical vision of why we're so interested and in why we're so excited in, in this property. Uh, in addition to that, it's boots on the ground. We have not as of, um, you know, today we haven't been on the ground as owners because it's been snowy up there right so another right. breakup is, is done the ground is firm so we're uh, we're sending our teams up there and so it's now uh, the next 30 to 60 days we'll be prospecting looking at the faults um because there's excellent outcrop in, in the crooklyn lake camp so we're going to be doing uh, some old school methodologies just getting familiar with the property we're going to follow that up with some geophysics uh some pointed geophysics which is going to help us uh, point the drills in the right direction with the aim of, of drilling. I mean, that's what we're in this business for is, is drilling that billion dollar discovery drill hole on the Cadillac, uh, the amalgamated domain, wherever it is, I don't know yet, but we're looking for it. So it's, it's all about the drill program and we're working our way um, quickly, but we're never going to rush. We want to do it right. Um, but we'll get there soon. Be quick, but don't hurry. Exactly. <laughs> um, well, on your, uh, on your last webinar, you signed off saying, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, you're going to get back to them within a day. And I, I think from a leadership standpoint, that is, especially during these, uh, these times, that is a great, great slogan to have and a, a very, very good thing to do. Well, on behalf of the Canadian Securities Exchange, one, we want to thank you for your continued listing. Uh, two, we want you to continue to be safe and sound uh, for you and your family. And three, you and Ms. Dango have been an excellent guest on this edition of Mining Mondays. I'm your host, Barrington Miller, and I'm here with Stephen Stewart. Thank you very much. Thanks, Barrington.